R factor. Now a lot of people don't look at this as a start to an energy efficiency audit, but is a crucial first step. Your voltage levels into a facility influence all energy consuming devices, whether they be old inefficient devices or the new electronic types of devices uh, in every situation. Voltage levels can either be harmful or severely damaging or just increase your energy consumption. Vol high levels of voltage and low voltage levels both lead to increased energy consumption as well as decreased equipment life, particularly in new efficient systems. The power factor into a facility is uh, often neglected, is particularly in smaller facilities, as it uh, is not a direct consumer of energy. The power factor determines how efficiently you're using the power that you're drawing from the grid uh, in terms of real and reactive power. Part to an energy efficiency audit is also to examine the tariffs. In South Africa, there are numerous tariff options around where the tariffs uh, differ between ESCOM, municipalities, and local authorities. It's crucial for a company to initially look at the tariffs that it is on to ensure that the energy it is using is at the lowest possible rate for their facility. Then you start getting down to the various energy consuming devices in the facility. The first and often low hanging fruit in a facility is the lighting environment. Your lighting system consists of artificial and natural lighting and it's key to look not only at the technology of this lighting but also at how it's controlled and how the behavior of staff can be changed to encourage the most efficient use of the lighting system. The building envelope and insulation. The building envelope is the thermal blanket essentially around the building. This is what protects the building from direct sunlight and heat infiltration, particularly in South Africa where we are mostly a cooling climate. The insulation of a building is also key to examine. Insulation can lead to significant cost reductions in air conditioning and will help to control the inside environment of the building far more effectively than simply installing more chillers. The HVAC of a building in South Africa is often the highest consumer, particularly in the commercial sector. HVAC stands for heating, ventilation and air conditioning. Your in South Africa, we have significant cooling loads due to our very warm climate and often we find that we have very large air conditioning systems. It's crucial to examine not only the technology of these systems but also how it's controlled and how it's maintained. IT equipment in facilities, particularly on the client side, is often a significant user of energy and is often neglected through identifying ways where sustainable behavior change can be done in the staff to ensure that IT equipment is only used when it's required and is always switched off at night is often a significant way to reduce energy with a very good payback time. Water heating is currently done in South Africa primarily through electrical geysers. There are significant opportunities there where heat pumps as well as solar water heaters offer large energy savings and with the rebates that ESCOM is currently offering have significantly good payback periods. Then we get to the industrial side of things where we find motors, fans, pumps and drives. Now these motors, fans, pumps and drives are probably the largest user of energy in South Africa and are often used very inefficiently. It's crucial to identify how the, where the motors are in a facility, what size they are, how they are used and what their function is and then to look at if, you can, if it's better to match the requirement with a better, better quality motor, a lower spec motor uh, or even with advanced control options such as variable speed drives. Compressed air is the most expensive form of energy that you can get as a compressed air system is generally around 10% efficient. This is due to very large heating dissipation of your compressor, but it's also due to poor maintenance in facilities. 
things like air leak detection are simple, easy things to do, which often lead to sustainable energy savings in a facility. Then you get your specialized industrial environments with refrigeration and boiler and steam systems. These type of environments need to be, uh, need to be examined very carefully to ensure that your supply matches your demand. Uh, that you only supply the refrigeration that's required or the steam that's required. By reducing either both your suppliers in this, in these sectors, you can get significant energy savings in a facility. And finally, the overall process and the overall system needs to be examined very carefully, as ad hoc interventions are not ideal, but rather a systems approach should, uh, should be used, as this will lead to the largest energy savings in a facility. So the business case for energy efficiency audits. The business case for energy efficiency audits is simple. You establish a comprehensive baseline and energy management path that encompasses all the systems as opposed to ad hoc interventions. This is because all systems are interlinked. You don't want to just replace a lighting system when you have voltage problems as your new efficient lighting system will break and have a low lifespan due to voltage issues. That's just one example. So it's key to make sure that whatever you do, when you're looking at energy in a facility, that you don't simply look at ad hoc interventions, but rather take a holistic systems approach to ensure that you achieve the highest amount of energy savings possible. So by doing an energy efficiency audit in a facility and implementing interventions, this helps lead to energy security throughout the whole region. We've seen South Africa is in the midst of a power crisis and the only way to fix that in the short term is through energy efficiency. Now energy is very important to all of our, all of our daily lives and leads to a lot of people, everyone needs energy to make money. So energy security is vital in South Africa and energy efficiency is the one way to help achieve that. For your own business, cost savings are naturally a part of energy efficiency audits and interventions. By reducing your energy consumption, you reduce your cost significantly. This also leads to a reduction in carbon emissions. As energy is such a large part of South, African, South Africa's carbon footprint, a reduction in carbon emissions uh, is very achievable by reducing your energy consumption. It forms part of the good business journey. We've seen companies such as Woolworths getting a large amount of good press about the good business journey they're on to be more environmentally friendly. And finally, it, meet, it helps to meet the sustainability goals for triple bottom line reporting in your company. Uh, whilst reducing your costs, you're also reducing your impact on the environment. So, the final key thing to note for business case is that it's very important for a third party to do a gap analysis of a facility to, offer, to provide another independent perspective as companies often undertake energy efficiency projects themselves and whilst they see a large portion of the energy savings available, it helps to identify other areas where energy reductions can be made. So let's start talking about energy management action plans. An energy efficiency program is not a linear program, but much more circular program. You initially begin by assessing your current energy state, and that comes from doing an energy efficiency audit. The outcomes of your energy efficiency audit are, is your energy management action plan. This incorporates designs, that then need to be implemented. Once you have implemented your energy management action plan, or the first parts of it, you then begin to monitor your energy savings to identify if you have achieved significant energy savings and what the financial implication of that is. You then reassess your facility. By reassessing your facility, as once you've implemented your first round of, of energy efficiency, you then see further areas for efficient design and using the money that you've saved through energy efficiency implementations previously, you can then fund larger, more expensive projects. 
So it's very important to note that the energy efficiency process is circular and it never ends as a company can always become more efficient at what it does. So the way I look at energy management action plans is four different levels, each with varying cost implications. The first level of an energy management action plan should be behavior change. By encouraging behavior change in an organization, you can create low-cost, long-term energy savings. The only way to create real, tangible behavior change within an organization is through training and education. Training and education empowers the staff and personnel at a facility, whether it be a commercial or industrial facility, or even in the home, to reduce energy consumption was they've been empowered through knowledge and they then know the impact that their behavior has on not only on cost but also on the environment. I then classify immediate retrofits. These are retrofits that have short-term paybacks and have little impact, little to no impact on the environment of the building. These could be quick lighting retrofits or ensuring that the HVAC system is correctly controlled using timers. They have very short-term paybacks, as I said, and they're very easy to implement. The next step to an energy management action plan is testing and future retrofits. Not all of the opportunities identified in a facility will be, a, will be able to be implemented immediately. It's therefore important to test, uh, if required, certain retrofits, whether they be lighting or different pieces of process equipment, and then to create feasibility studies and detailed designs on these new higher capex, more complicated retrofits. Often you have very large energy savings in this category, but they often have longer term payback periods. In order to help finance these longer term payback periods, you can use the energy you've saved through behavior change and immediate retrofits and the cost savings from that to help finance your future retrofits in a facility. And then last but not least is long-term upgrades. Now long-term upgrades often include things like renewable energy systems. So once your facility is operating very efficiently, you can then look to run it off a renewable energy system such as rooftop PV or uh, wind power in the parking lot. This type of energy management action plan leads to long-term sustainable energy savings and cost reductions for a company that uh, can often be very significant, particularly in the environment of South Africa at the moment, where we have very high energy increases planned for the next few years, where ESCOM is looking at 25% and higher energy increases and tariff increases. So speaking of ESCOM, I'm sure we've all heard in the news recently about the new round of ESCOM funding that's available. ESCOM has recognized that reducing energy consumption in, in existing installations in South Africa is far more cost effective and quicker than building new power stations to address our current energy crisis. So ESCOM have revamped the DSM program and called it the Integrated Demand Management Program, or IDM for short. This is five key delivery channels. The first delivery channel is the ESCO process. The ESC, or each of these I will discuss in a bit more detail on the next slide. The ESCO process encompasses all energy saving projects and requires very detailed designs. Due to the long turnaround time of this process, ESCOM then creates a, the standard offer process. The standard offer process or program is a program where ESCOM will buy back energy savings from the client at a specified rate. The standard product program is the latest program to be rolled out by ESCOM. The standard product program is centered now around lighting as an initial technology, where ESCOM have approved certain technologies uh, and they recognize that these will save energy and have set certain set rebates for these technologies. The other two programs, which the one of which will be familiar to you, being the mass rollout program, where well, ESCOM has been on a mass rollout of CFLs throughout South Africa to reduce energy consumption, where the CFLs replaced incandescent lighting. Other mass rollout programs that are being spoken about 
our solar water heater rollout programs and low flow shower head programs.